What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another brand new installment of Renegades Reviews, exclusively here as always on the Casa D18 Studios channel. I, of course, am your host, the Renegade J.J. Williams, and today we're going to take a look at the first film this week to actually feature the Beatles, and that is the 2016 documentary, The Beatles, Eight Days a Week, the Turing Years, put together by Ron Howard and starring, of course, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, Ringo Starr, and featuring additional interviews with Eddie Izzard, Whoopi Goldberg, Elvis Costello, and Sigourney Weaver, amongst others. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for joining me here once again for another brand new installment of Renegades Reviews. And like I said during the introduction, today's entry is the first one to actually feature the legitimate Beatles as the stars of their own film. And we're going to take a look at the documentary Eight Days a Week by Ron Howard. And our film basically takes a look at the grueling schedule that the Beatles faced touring from 1963 to 1966. We first show some flashback footage of the Quarrymen and John meeting Paul and the Cavern Club and Hamburg, Germany. And then in March of 1963, sees the release of their debut album, Please Please Me. In addition to a performance from the ABC Cinema in Manchester, England. Now, two days after the performance at the ABC Cinema, a live BBC radio broadcast announces the assassination of John F. Kennedy. On the same day as the Kennedy assassination, with the Beatles is released. Now, one month later, in December of 1963, I Want to Hold Your Hand is played for the very first time in America. The success of I Want to Hold Your Hand leads to the Beatles' first visit to the United States in February of 1964. Now, on February 9, 1964, the Beatles perform on The Ed Sullivan Show, where approximately half of the country have their televisions tuned into the performance. The documentary then introduces us to Brian Epstein, who is responsible for the molding of the image for the Beatles, the suits and the boots, as opposed to the leather jackets that they used to wear back in the Hamburg days. How he discovered them and became a confidant of theirs, along with becoming their manager. Now, two days after their performance on The Ed Sullivan Show, they have their very first U.S. concert in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. And in April of 1964, they appear on a Scottish television show called Roundup. We then get a brief interview with Paul as he talks about his and John's songwriting technique over the years and how they had to crank out song after song after song, sometimes having to write within hotels and vans on the way to venues, whatever it took to create the next hit song. Paul goes on to mention how he and John probably wrote 300 songs during the Beatle years. In June of 1964, the Beatles play Melbourne, Australia, as well as New Zealand. Then, in July of 1964, comes A Hard Day's Night, their very first motion picture, as well as the accompanying album. In August of 1964, the Beatles play the Hollywood Bowl in Southern California for the very first time. And the soundtrack for this film is comprised of 
the recordings from the Hollywood Bowl over their multiple shows there. Now, at one point during their tour, segregation attempts to shut down their concert in Jacksonville, Florida. However, the Beatles put their foot down and state that they will not perform in front of a segregated crowd, a battle in which they win during a time when people didn't win those type of battles. The civil rights movement was still a couple years off, and this was a huge win for civil rights led by the Beatles. We then get into the specifics of some of the recording sessions and how a single needed to be released every three months with an album every six months. We then learn about how George Martin was the driving force in the studio during the early years, something that as the Beatles matured, George Martin kind of started to take a little bit of a back seat as specifically John and Paul became more hands-on in the production. December of 1964 sees the release of Beatles for Sale. And we then transition into the making of their second motion picture, Help, and how they were under the influence of marijuana during the majority of the filming, you know, just to get by. In August of 1965, the Beatles play Shea Stadium, which was the very first time that venue was ever used for a concert. They talk about the controversial butcher cover for Yesterday and Today from June of 1966, as well as the creative process behind Tomorrow Never Knows, followed by the August 1966 release of Revolver. We then tackle the Bigger Than Jesus scandal, where John Lennon made an off-the-cuff comment about how in Britain, the Beatles are more popular than Jesus Christ. And the con the and how the comment got taken out of context. He wasn't trying to say that they were better than Jesus or that Jesus was less than them. But if you were to poll society at the time, the Beatles meant more to the youth than religion did. And that was all he was trying to point out. Now, coming out of the Bigger Than Jesus scandal, the Beatles begin to feel fed up with the grueling tour schedule. First George and then John, three months after officially calling it quits on touring full time, they reconvene at EMI Studios to begin working on their next album. That album would become Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which Rolling Stone back in 2012 declared was the greatest album of all time. Our film comes to the conclusion with the factoid that the Beatles recorded five more albums in the following four years and only performed live one more time on the rooftop of their office building in January of 1969, which the footage was used for the documentary from 1970, Let It Be, and is going to be repurposed for Peter Jackson's documentary, which is supposed to come out later this year. This film is a great timeline documentary for anybody seeking to learn a good chunk of meat and potatoes type of structure about the Beatles. It doesn't cover too much their early days like Birth of the Beatles did, or like we'll get into with Backbeat tomorrow. But this basically covers from Please Please Me through Sgt. Pepper, very detailed, very diligently. 
and then kind of touches on the follow-up albums, Magical Mystery Tour, Yellow Submarine, The White Album, Abbey Road, and Let It Be. Those five albums that came over the following four years, which if you want to get technical, should be counted as six since the White Album is a double album. Had those been released separately, it would have been two separate albums. So technically six albums worth of material in four years. It's just amazing what the creative process was able to conjure once they stopped having to do the day-to-day grind of touring. And it's rumored, rumored, that if you listen to the song And Your Bird Can Sing from Revolver, that a lot of that song is about John and the rest of the guys trying to tell Brian that they didn't want to do it anymore. You know, lyrics like, you tell me that you've got everything you want and your bird can sing, but you don't get me. You don't get me. As well as, you tell me that you've heard every sound there is and your bird can swing, but you can't hear me. You can't hear me. Like, you don't get what I'm trying to tell you. You're not hearing what we're telling you. We don't want to do this anymore. Just one of the rumors regarding that song. What do you guys think out there? If you've seen this film, let me know. Leave your thoughts and comments over here if you're watching along with the live stream. Or if you're watching along Later on, on demand, leave your thoughts and comments down here. When it comes to my rating for this film, with it being a documentary, I'm only going to give it four out of five stars because I do wish that they had just gone ahead and covered the entire career instead of chopping it off at Sgt. Pepper. You know, I think it would have been better if they had just gone ahead and finished going into depth and detail over the rest of the albums. I kind of get why they did what they did because Please Please Me was the beginning of the success and the touring and Sgt. Pepper was the first album to come after they stopped touring. So I kind of get it, but at the same time, they put so much in depth with this documentary that I really wish that they had gone ahead and just finished covering the rest of the Beatles years again. What do you guys think? Those of you that have seen eight days a week, let me know. Leave your thoughts and comments over here. Or if you're watching on demand, leave your thoughts and comments down there. Whatever you do, though, when you get out there on the social media, let's try to get those hashtags trending. Hashtag Casa D18 Studios. Hashtag Renegades Reviews. Hashtag Renegade Returns. And, of course, the ever-popular hashtag Shenanigans. We interrupt this episode of Renegades Reviews for an important announcement about... Merchandising. Merchandising? What's that? Merchandising. Come, I'll show you. Merchandising, merchandising, where the real money's made. Make sure you go over to teespring.com slash stores slash Jeff Meacham Network for all the t-shirts you see here from the West Coast professor Jeff Meacham himself. You can get shirts for the Jeff Meacham Network, Talk Wrestling, as well as the red and gold Meachamania shirts. And while you're there, don't forget to get your shirts of the Casa D18 Studios Brotherhood, the Dads on Wrestling shirt, the Renegade J.J. Williams, Stat Boy Sports Bar, and the hashtag Stat Boy Approved shirt. Make sure you go over to teespring.com slash stores slash Jeff Meacham Network and score your shirts today. Make sure you guys go out there. Do what that commercial just told you. Go to teespring.com slash stores slash Jeff Meacham Network for all the official merchandise of the Casa D18 Studios Brotherhood. Get you your Renegade J.J. Williams shirt. Dad's Not Always on Wrestling. Stat Boy Sports Bar. Hashtag Stat Boy Approved. Hashtag Shenanigans. Get you your official merchandise from the Jeff Meacham Network. 
three different designs of the Jeff Meacham Network logo for you to choose from, along with Talk Wrestling, Meachamania, so much more. Still summertime, still plenty of time for those barbecues, pool parties, beach bonfires. Go to the Teespring store, get yourself a tank top. You can choose from the Renegade J.J. Williams or Meachamania. Either one is the perfect accessory for those hot summer days and those even hotter summer nights. Get out there, show your love and support. Make sure you guys tune back in here tomorrow. Exclusively here as always on the Casa D18 Studios channel for another brand new installment of Renegades Reviews when we take a look at the biopic Backbeat starring Cheryl Lee, Stephen Dorff, Ian Hart, Gary Bakewell, Chris O'Neill, Scott Williams, Kai Weisinger, Paul Duckworth, Jennifer L., and others. Now, the difference between Backbeat and Birth of the Beatles, right here out the gate, they're very similar films, except Backbeat focuses more on Stu Sutcliffe, whereas Birth of the Beatles focused more on John, Paul, and the Beatles. So Backbeat very much focuses on Stu, Astrid, all that stuff. So it's still a good movie. Still going to get into it. Still a lot to talk about with it. But just know that there's going to be a lot of similarities between the two films. Thank you for all my loyal fans and viewers out there tuned in today, watching along during the live stream, the premiere, leaving your thoughts and comments over here. Thank you very much. I appreciate each and every one of you guys. Likewise, to all my loyal fans and viewers tuning in a little bit later in the day, watching on demand, leaving your thoughts and comments down here. Thank you very much. I appreciate each and every one of you guys. I appreciate all my loyal fans and viewers out there tuning in on a regular basis, showing me all that love and support. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you guys next time.